Shall we bow our heads in a word of prayer? Father, again we come in the precious name of Jesus, asking for a new anointing from heaven and for divine illumination upon the word. Speak to our hearts once again. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I really don't know what to say about this message tonight. I trust it will be instructional, and so I hope that it will help someone. However, I'm, I'll probably get into some theological areas, and that immediately puts me in a position where I probably will, some of you will disagree with me, and I want you to know right now that it's perfectly all right with me, and I have no quarrel with you, and you may be right. Now, I don't know how you can beat that, so let's just, uh, <laughs> but I'll just tell you how I feel about it, and then, and then uh, we'll just leave it go with that. How about that? So if you have your Bibles, I want this to help us to see a little bit about the Arabs and Jews. And I'm trusting God will help us in this, and I certainly am not going to solve all the problems about the Arabs and Jews. That's not my purpose, but to help us to see a little bit about some of the situation. In the 12th chapter of the book of Genesis, <clears throat> chapter 12 of Genesis, beginning with the first verse, now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee. And I will make of thee a great nation. And I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse them that curseth thee. And in thee shall all the families of the earth be blessed. That really is quite a statement. Isn't it? I think the New International Version says, Through thee all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. All of them. Now, I want you to see something. First of all, I want you to know that that blessing was not material. He did not promise to bless everybody materially. Now, I know that part of the blessing is to give the land of Canaan to Abraham, but I also want you to know that if you're saved and you know Jesus and you know you're going to heaven, I want you to know that you have received something far greater than all of Canaan itself. So now whatever God offered to Abraham, I want you to know that he has offered, in the way of Canaan, I want you to know he's offered you something more. Are you still with me? Yes, sir. Now, this blessing, though, coming back to this, this blessing that he said all the nations of the world shall be blessed, this blessing, really, Paul tells us over here in, in Galatians, he said, in thy seed... Through thy seed, all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. In Galatians, the third chapter, the 16th verse, it says, Now to Abraham and his seed, the promises, where the promises made, he saith not unto seeds, that's to all of his ancestors, as of many, but unto one, unto thy seed, which is Christ. So now notice that it's simply from Abraham, the blessing that all the families of the earth were going to be blessed was through Christ. I want you to see this now. The real blessing of Abraham was a covenant God made with him to bless all the families of the earth, but the blessing was Christ. Now that's as good to the Arabs as it is to the Jews. So the blessing, you see, was to all of them, the blessing of all the families. So the covenant, the covenant blessing of Abraham was Christ. Now, so all we have here, the, mess the Messianic line, and uh, God said he was going to bring that Messianic line through Sarah. He promised that. He made the covenant with that through Sarah and not through Hagar, this second wife, the wife that he had, uh, which was from Egypt. And uh, so I want you to know that Sarah wasn't any better than Hagar. Now, I said you might differ with me, see, no. Hey. 
But Sarah was not any better than Hagar. Hagar was proud and, and, and gloating, and Sarah was harsh and unreasonable. Yet I want you to know God loved them both. God also loved Ishmael just as much as he did Isaac. I hope I'm not upsetting your theology here, but I'm telling you how I believe, what I believe God says, what he's doing, because often we think here, oh, God's blessing was Abraham and so on Isaac, and poor Ishmael's left out in the cold. No, Ishmael's not left out in the cold. God loved him just as much as he did Isaac. And he loved Hagar just as much as he did Sarah. And although Abraham left all that he had to Isaac, I want you to know that God turned around and gave Ishmael just as much. He just simply didn't give it through Abraham. But he gave it. Look at Genesis, the 17th chapter. God, well, maybe I can, if I can find this. Uh, in the 17th chapter, and... Uh, Starting with the 18th verse, it said, Abraham said unto God, O oh God, that Ishmael might live before thee. He's praying for Ishmael now. And God said, Sarah, thy wife shall bear a son indeed, and thou shalt call his name Isaac, and I will establish my covenant with him for an everlasting covenant with his seed after him. God was going to establish his covenant with Isaac. The only difference between the two of Ishmael and Isaac is that he established his covenant with Isaac. But Ishmael, Isaac was no better than Ishmael. Now, as for Ishmael, look at this one. As for Ishmael, I have heard thee. Behold, I have blessed him and will make him fruitful and will multiply him exceedingly. Twelve princes shall he beget and I will make him a great nation. But my covenant I will establish with Isaac, with which Sarah shall bear unto him at this set time of the next year. Notice he's going to bless Ishmael just as much as he did Isaac as far as the material world is concerned. And he's still done it tonight. He's blessed the Jews in many ways, but the Arabs are just as rich as the Jews in their oil industry, and they're some of the wealthiest people in the world. I want you to see that God loves them both. But he established his line, the line of the Messianic line, through Isaac, and that's where the blessing was going to come to bless the whole world, was Christ, which was going to come through Isaac, and this was the Messianic line. So he loved them both. Now, I may be in a little trouble here, and it's, it's all right. As I said, there's a difference of theology. You say, well, Brother Morgan, what about this scripture that says in, in Romans where God said of Jacob, uh, Esau have I, or Jacob have I loved, and Esau have I hated. And God said this before the children were ever born. Before neither one had done good or evil. And God said, I love the one, and I hate the other. Now, As somebody said, the Bible, the best commentary on the Bible is the Bible itself. So in order to understand that scripture, I've really got to put it in the light of the whole Bible. I can't pick out one scripture and hold it there and say this is a doctrine. You cannot do that with any scripture. You must interpret all scripture in light of other scriptures. So when God says... Jacob have I loved, and Esau have I hated, and neither one of them had, uh, had done either good or evil. You've got to interpret this in the nature of God. And you say, God can do anything. Well, brother, I want you to know something. He will not do anything outside of his nature. Just like Paul said, wasn't he, in writing to Titus, he said, the God that cannot lie. I, I don't care what you say, God can't lie. You can say he can do anything, well, he can do anything within his nature, but he can't do anything outside of his nature. And his nature won't permit him to lie, so that's what Paul said, the God that cannot lie promised this. So, if I understand this, this scripture, I'm trying to get this of Jacob and Esau in order again to picture of Isaac and Ishmael. Jacob have I loved, but, but Esau have I hated. Well, I've got to interpret that in light of God's nature. I know that he's holy. And I know he's righteous, and I've got to interpret it in, within that framework, or I'm going to miss the meaning. If I don't, I've missed it. 
So now the only thing I can do is to look at that scripture and let's look at some others. Jesus came along and said, except a man hate his father and mother and wife and children. For my sake, he cannot be my disciple. He's the same thing. Now, if you're going to say God hates Jacob, then you're going to have to say, brother, you better hate your wife. You, go, you sticking with me? Yes, say, brother, yeah, but I, a man would have, have a right to get up and say, look, the scripture says I have a right to hate my wife. Well, I've got to interpret that scripture in the light of other scriptures. What does the Bible say? The Bible says God specifically says, husbands, love your wives. I've got to interpret that with that. And he also says, honor your father and mother. So whatever he says, hate your father and mother, I've got to interpret that with the rest of the scripture, which says, honor your father. I've got to get them both together because God doesn't contradict himself. And he said, even hate your own life. Go around and say, well, I hate my life. Now notice he says it in context to be my disciple. These are comparative, contrasting uh, words. In other words, he's saying you must love Jesus so much greater than your father and mother and wife, so much greater that it's the distance between love and hate. There shouldn't be anything come any ways near your love for Christ. And the same thing is true with Isaac now, back to Isaac and Ishmael. Um... God's covenant was with Isaac. Now, it isn't that he loved Ishmael, Isaac any more than Ishmael, but he chose uh, Isaac to be the one that the covenant blessing of Christ should come through that line. But I want to show you that, that he didn't love Ishmael, uh, Isaac any more than Ishmael because Ishmael had as much right to the covenant as Isaac had. And he could get in on the covenant, although it didn't come through him, he could get in on it. Because God gave the covenant the right of circumcision as a covenant sign to Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. And he turned right around and gave that sign to Ishmael. So Ishmael got in on the covenant, although it didn't come through him, he got in on it. And although you tonight are not Jews that are here, most of you are not Jews, I want you to know you can get in on the blessing of Abraham because it was promised through him to all the families of the earth and we all can get in on it although it wasn't, although it wasn't promised to us. You still with me? So, so notice that Ishmael got in on this blessing because God, Abraham took Ishmael and he was circumcised uh, right along with Abraham and Isaac. So that was part of the covenant and he got in on the covenant, although it didn't come through him, he got in on it. So the covenant right was given to Abraham. That was the messianic line was to going to come through Isaac. And all, the only difference in Isaac and Ishmael was that God gave them the privilege for the messianic line to come through uh, Isaac and Jacob and down through that line and they were blessed in that and that was a blessing so that Jew had an advantage over others in the fact that they received the promises of God and knew more about it than anybody in the world and that's worth something to know about it. The promises and doctrines that you have heard preached in this church of self-denial doesn't make you any better than anybody but you're privileged more than anybody else because you've heard it when others haven't heard it. So, when it comes to salvation, Mary, being a Jew, she needed salvation as much as you and I need it. She wasn't saved just because she was Jew. Because Mary herself said in Luke, the first chapter, the 46th and 47th verse, Mary speaks and she says, My soul doth magnify the Lord, my spirit hath rejoiced in God my Savior. That's from Mary's own words. So she needed a savior the same as anybody else, although she was the, was the one who gave birth to the Messiah. And here was the line, a long line of Abraham, the promise and covenant and blessing of promise to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, come on down to Mary and very Mary to end here this covenant of having the Christ. She herself needed the savior. She needed the results of the covenant and the covenant herself didn't give her salvation. So, 
We see that God chooses individuals to carry on his purposes in the world. He chose the Jewish people. They're his chosen people. I don't doubt that. He chose them and gave them a specific job, and they had a task of bringing Christ to the world and, and God to the nations, and they were chosen for a particular purpose. The same as apostles. They're chosen with a particular purpose, but being called an apostle doesn't save anybody. Every apostle must get saved just like anybody else. Brother Helm had to get saved when he was 17 years old. Although he was called an apostle, he still had to get saved. His calling as an apostle didn't save him. So whatever calling you may have, that calling won't save you. Brother, you're going to have to go after God just as hard as anybody else. You're going to have to go after God just as hard as anybody that thinks they don't have any calling at all. So your calling doesn't advantage you, but it is a calling through which God will work his purposes in the world. If you let him and follow him and obey him, then he has certain divine providences that he's going to work through your calling. And it doesn't make you any better than anybody else. So God's plans and purposes in the earth still run through the Jew. God gave them the land of Canaan. I think he's never taken that back. As far as I'm concerned, that land still belongs to the Jew. But I want you to know also that he gave land to Ishmael, gave land to Isaac, even in Deuteronomy. When the children of Israel walked through Esau's land, God said, don't you touch that land, I've given that to them. So he gave them land the same as he gave Jews Canaan. And as far as I'm concerned, the Bible's never taken that back. That Palestine still belongs to, to, to uh, the Jews. And God still is working his purposes out in the world through his divine providence and through the Jews. And as somebody said, the Jews are God's timetable in, the, in this world. And I believe they are. He's still working out his purposes clear to the end of time through the Jews. But they need salvation the same as anybody else. So through the blessing of Abraham, the Jew can be saved and the Arab can be saved and the Gentile can be saved all through the covenant of Abraham. All can get it. So God's blessing is there. It's for everybody. Now, don't be too hard on the Arabs. And because Ishmael is a type of human nature. And if you're hard on Ishmael, I want you to know that same spirit is in us. And God said of Ishmael, he was a wild man, and his hand would be against every man, and every man's hand against him. He'd be a wild man. And Isaac, the opposite of a spiritual man, he was a quiet man, and a man of peace, and a loving man, fulfilling the type. And uh, if anybody wanted to take anything away from Isaac, you let him take it. When the Philistines came along to take the, Abra the wells that Abraham dug, Isaac just let him have it. He wasn't a man of war at all. So Ishmael was a wild man. There is this nature within us that we'll be against. And I tell you, look, so all you got to do is look at the world today and see that every man's hands against everybody else. I tell you, everybody's against everybody. It's a mess. All the whole world, every country you look at, there's turmoil and starvation and plundering and people trying to get to the top and rule over others and fighting. It's a, it's a, it's a looks like a wild man out there everywhere you turn. But it takes Jesus Christ to take that wild out of us. And that covenant belongs to us as well as to anyone else, as well as to the Jew or the Gentile or the Arabs or anyone else. So God loved both Hagar and, and Sarah. He loved them both. And uh, as I said, Hagar was proud and goading and Sarah was harsh and unreasonable, but God loved them both. And I want you to see something even today. The person that's hard to get along with. It may be amazing what God will do with them and through them. When God can conquer that wild nature in them. And so don't get upset with a person that seems to be wild. I mean, it, it could be amazing what God will turn around and do with somebody like that. So the covenant blessing did not come through them, uh, but they can get in on it. That is through the Arabs. But they can get in on it. They can have just as much of it as the Jews can have. And the, as somebody said, Jacob's unbelieving descendants were as much excluded from the covenant as were the unbelieving Ishmaelites and Esau. They were excluded from it. 
That's why actually the word of God says Jesus came to his own, but his own received him not. But as many as received him, to them gave he power to become the sons of God. Those that received him. So the Gentiles, the believing Gentiles, got in on the covenant of blessing as well as the Jews or anyone else. In Galatians 3, 7, Paul said, Believe that believers are uh, in, the believers in Christ are Abraham's children. These are those in on the blessing. The real blessing are, of Abraham was Christ. In Philippians 3.3, 3, he says, We are the circumcision which worship God in the Spirit and rejoice in Christ and have no confidence in the flesh. That is, those that have accepted Christ got in on the covenant. That's the real circumcision. The other is earthly. And uh, Stephen said in Acts 7.51, Stephen said, Ye uncircumcised of heart and ear, you do always resist the Holy Ghost. So many Jews accepted the symbolism of the Judaistic religion. They accepted the symbols uh, for the real thing. All their ceremonies and so forth and ritual, they accepted that as though that made them God's favorite. And we've done the same thing. In the Christian religion, we have accepted the symbols for the real thing. Communion, baptism, church joining. And when we do these things, people think they're Christians. Those are the symbols. And those things never made anybody Christian. But they are symbols, and the great danger today is there are thousands and probably millions of people that accepted the symbols as the real thing. And they, they, all they've got is the shadow. So even Old Testament saints knew there was something better than Canaan. Abraham knew that. Abraham said, look for a city whose builder and maker was God. And he never did, as I've mentioned before, uh, settle down in Canaan. He stayed there as a stranger and pilgrim in the land of promise and never owned anything but a burial plot. And David said in the 39th Psalm, David said, a he was a stranger and a sojourner as all my fathers were he was a stranger and a sojourner in the land of Canaan. He said, all my fathers were strangers and sojourners in the land of Canaan. So they knew there was something better than literal Canaan. And yet literal Canaan belongs to the Jew and still will go to them. And God's working out his eternal earthly purposes through them. And they have a place in God's economy. And God has never changed that. Peter said, we are strangers and pilgrims on the earth. So we are strangers and pilgrims. Well, I'm trusting and hoping that you can see something tonight. I want you to know that God loves the Jew. I want you to know he loves the Gentile. I want you to know he loves the Arabs. And he's run his divine purposes through the Jews. But, the, but as far as the covenant blessing is concerned, it's open to the Jew. It's open to the Arabs. It's open to the Gentiles. It's open to everybody on the family of face of the earth. That's why God could say to Abraham, all the families of the earth are going to be blessed because you have obeyed me. So I'm trusting that we get in on God's blessing. Now, if you disagree with my theology, it's all right. If we get a hold of Jesus and hang on to him, we'll all come out all right. 